Thank you so much, Haley, and good morning to all of you. It is a joy to see you here in the services this morning, and uh, I just spent some time over in our Spanish ministry. We observed the Lord's Supper, and it was just such a uh, sweet time to see so many people there in our Spanish congregation. Love the Lord, and uh, I, uh, I'm just thrilled to see what the Lord is doing. What a tremendous tremendous group we have here for a holiday Labor Day weekend, and I trust that you're ready to open God's Word, learn something. Our men are coming forward. If you perhaps slid in a side door, did not get a copy this morning of the notes, I would uh, encourage you, uh, just raise your hand, get a copy of those notes, so that way everyone can follow along this morning and 
be a part of this morning's message. Good to see Gaylene Yeager in the service. Been a little while since she's been able to be here. Just some different health things going on, and she's got her 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 beautiful smile this morning and thrilled to be back in church. So that's great to see her. I've met some visitors uh, before the service. Thank you for being here this morning. Great to see Sharon Brock officially move back here to Tucson. And, um, of course, under sad circumstances, her father passed away, and, uh, and she, uh, she helped take care of him for a couple of years. And, but she's back here in town. Good to see you, Sharon. Are you ready to, to learn something this morning? We're here to learn something about the Lord, and I trust that you'll be encouraged this morning as we get into the Word of God. Take your Bibles, go to 1 John chapter number 2. You're going to need to help me this morning. You're going to read a couple verses here. So if you have your Bibles, 1 John chapter 2, in just a moment, the words will be on the screen behind me, or if you do not have a Bible, there should be one in the row that you're in, and uh, feel free to, to use that this morning. As we've worked through these first passages in the letter of 1 John, here's what we've done. We've learned the difference between what there is called a relationship with God and having fellowship with God. We began a relationship with God by virtue of that new birth or salvation. At that moment, we trusted him as our personal Lord and Savior. When I bowed my knees at the age of 19 before the Lord, at that moment, I began an eternal relationship that can never be taken away. Aren't you thankful for salvation, that it is not something that I have to work, I have to earn, I have to give money to, that the God of heaven wants to have relationship with you. And when you believed in his son, Jesus Christ, and you accepted what his son did at Calvary for your sins, and you acknowledged that you were a sinner, and you began a new life with him forever, for the rest of the eons of time, you have relationship. Jesus said in John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life. Now listen to what these, this next phrase here in this verse says. There are some of you who struggle. Am I really saved? Did I say the right words? How do I know that I'm not going to lose that? I love the second part of John 10 and verse 28. Listen to what it says. I gave unto, unto them eternal life. That's relationship. I have given unto everyone who's believed on my son, Jesus Christ, eternal life. And they shall never perish and, shall, and no man shall pluck them out of my hand. In other words, you cannot lose your salvation. Can we say amen to that this morning? That is awesome. We have a security in knowing that I have an eternal home in heaven. My relationship with God is permanent. It cannot be taken away. However, first and first John, the author John is teaching is this, that my fellowship with God is not permanent. My fellowship with God is not permanent. Fellowship in that sense of closeness or intimacy that comes from walking closely with him. My relationship with God can never be broken, but my fellowship with him is often broken, often broken in three different ways. First, we intentionally walk in the darkness or what we referred to as sin in the previous messages, or we deny our sin, or we rationalize our sin. And when we do these things, we break our fellowship with God. Sometimes Shelly and I will we'll lay in bed at night, we've been through a long day, and we just you know, we'll scroll through some channels and see if there's something to watch, and we'll stumble upon a medical program, and we'll learn about different diseases and, and symptoms and, 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 and medical uh, problems that people have, and, and if I'm not careful, and, and see if this has ever happened to you, you've listened, and you, and, and you, and you begin to imagine, I have some of those symptoms, and, and um, that, that ache in my right leg, and they're having a, a program about that. Uh, oh, no, I need to go see my doctor. And we begin to, uh, we begin to imagine some things. It's called hypochondria. And, uh, and um, a hypochondriac believes that something is terribly wrong with his health when there's actually nothing wrong with him. It's more, uh, it's more of, I, I, I've watched something. I've been influenced. Uh, I met a lady back in South Carolina. And we would come to church, and, 
and she was sick every single Sunday. And she would tell us about her sickness. I think she enjoyed being sick because she got all that attention. But on the other hand, I've met people who are genuinely sick, trying to discover what is going on with them and, and um, so that they can get healed from that. May I just say, there are some people that are genuinely sick spiritually. And this morning, we need to learn how we can overcome that sickness. And um, uh, it seems to me that in today's passage, John is addressing what I'll call spiritual hypochondria. And with all this teaching on sin, he wants to reassure us that we know that we know him. So that you're there in 1 John chapter 2. Will you drop down to verse number 3? And let's uh, read our text passage together. Remember, we're going verse by verse through the book of 1 John. We're not in a hurry. We greatly desire that we have a better understanding of God's Word. And as a result of this study, I trust that we will know about 1 John. We're only going to read four verses this morning. I'm going to read verse 3 and 5, and you're going to read verse 4 and 6 in a responsive manner. So please help me this morning. Verse number 3, And hereby we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know that we are in him. It's not uncommon for believers to have doubts about their relationship. That's the first thing that happens. But separately, um, uh, uh, there are many of us who could genuinely struggle do I have fellowship? I think there could be a struggle. Am I really saved? As well as there's a struggle, do I have fellowship? But I want to assure you this morning, if you know Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, you need to set aside that struggle about relationship. And we need to focus as a believer, do I have fellowship, not just relationship? So John, here's what he wants to do. He wants to give us some no so faith by pointing out the marks of having a relationship and genuine fellowship with God. Now, in just a few moments, we're going to have a baptismal service, and so time doesn't permit us this Sunday to get into all the marks. So for our purposes, let's look at two marks this morning about what John is writing to us. Mark number one is that we can have an authentic relationship with God. It is possible to have an authentic relationship with God. What do I mean by authentic? I think the best way is to illustrate it. We have been privileged to be able to travel to China numerous times uh, throughout my ministerial career. In fact, I've taken many of you on uh, a mission trip to China, whether it was for a teen camp or a conference. So even within this congregation, several of you have been to China. It is always part of our trip that we go to what is called the silk market um, uh, for, to go shopping. Uh, of course, everything that's in your house came from China anyway, so why don't we just go to the source and go to the silk market? Or there's a, another market called the pearl market. And uh, they're very touristy, and people that visit China, especially Beijing, they go to either the silk or the pearl market. What it is, is uh, it's several floors at both places that sell everything that you can imagine. So anything that you have on your, uh, your being today, I can assure you, is at the pearl market or the silk market. Anything that you can think of, including coach and MK purses. And you go, and so in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, the pearl market. And so if you go to the third floor on the pearl market, um, uh, you go up the escalator, you make a right, and there is a whole floor of purses and belts and wallets. And you can get a deal. Any name brand that you can think of, it's there at the pearl market. And, the, and there's this group of, uh, of Chinese ladies, um, they're clamoring for your business, and, and they'll grab you physically, no lying, they'll physically grab you and try to pull you into their little booth to sell you and give you an amazing price. That amazing price for, would we'll say, a coach purse, that amazing price, it starts at like 300 U.S. dollars. 
And then she'll say, and then you say, oh, no, I'm not paying that. You turn around to walk away. Oh, no, no, sir, you come back. How much you pay? How much you pay? And I'd say, I, I wouldn't give you any more than $30 for that. Okay, okay, uh, uh, no, 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 too much. And she'll take out a piece of paper and she'll write another price. And, it, and it's going from 300 down to 150 And all of it is to wear you down to think that you're getting a great deal. We've had many teenage young ladies who have left there with a big smile on their face, whether it was an MK, a coach, or, or whatever name brand that they were looking for. They got an awesome purse. And they'll come back and they'll tell everybody, they paid $30, $40, $50 for this purse, only to discover that it is fake. In all of the pearl market, there is not a genuine coach purse. Every single one of them are fake, but they look really good. In fact, my wife has a couple of those. <laughs> and so we actually went into an MK store, and we walked through it, and the, and the, and the lady inside said, oh, nice purse, because it's so close to looking real. That from the, glance, from, from the glance on the outside, it looks authentic. May I just say sadly, please listen, there are many non-believers who look authentic. They're close. They're close. But they do not have relationship with God. I'm asking you this morning, are you an authentic, real believer? When I look at verse 3, I read that the authentic believer keeps God's commandments. John says, and hereby we do know that we know him. That means we can know that we can know that we can know him. Our relationship with God is not some subjective feeling, with, uh, but it is an objective reality. When John says, we do know that we know him, he's referring to a past experience. The tenses here in the Greek New Testament read literally, we know that we have known him. This phrase translates, we know that we have come to know him. In other words, listen to this. We can know that we have already been saved in the past by what we are doing today. Isn't that amazing? What is the mark? How is it that I can know that I know that I know him? You know what the Bible says? If I keep his what? Commandments. We don't know that we know God because I feel the presence of God. We don't know that we know him because I've read the Bible. We don't know uh, that we know him because we've prayed. We don't know that we know him because we uh, toss some money into the offering box. We know that we know him if we keep his commandments. The present willingness to keep God's commandments is a certain mark of someone who has already begun a relationship with him in the past. And some people simply get this principle turned around. Understand this clearly this morning, church family. You do not come to know God by keeping his commandments. You keep his commandments because you already know him. What a great truth. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. We come to know God through his son, Jesus Christ, by his grace and our faith in him. Salvation is nothing more than this. It is a gift from God. It cannot be earned. A relationship with God is not of works because then we could boast of our own accomplishment. I did more than so and so. When we receive Jesus into our lives by faith, he then comes in and he begins to change everything. Over the last few months, there's a transformation that's taken place on the second floor right behind me. Some of you who have been with us a while, let me describe and take you down memory lane. On the second floor behind me, there was lime green carpet that had never been changed. That was ripped and dirty. It had stains. It had a rubber backing that when we pulled it up, it left the most horrific mess. 
there was all manner of paint and different shades of paint. And as things had been patched through the years, it was really disgusting. There were, there were these dividers that, that you had to actually have, almost have two people pull them because, uh, uh, because they were kinked and, uh, and they were very difficult to manage. Well, a few months ago, we began a transformation, a change that took place. Now we have four state-of-the-art, beautiful classrooms, two new restrooms uh, uh, that can accommodate multiple people. We redid the baptistry area instead of, that, that, instead of those curtains that used to hang by these little chains. And, and, um, and when you change for baptism, you, everybody could see you from the knee down. There's actually a changing place where you can go and change for a baptism. There is a change that has taken place. May I just say... When Jesus comes into your life, there's a change that begins to take place. One of the changes is a proclivity to keep his commandments. He gives us a new attitude about his commandments. And though we still struggle with sins, we find ourselves drawn to his life. And even though we often fail, there's this inner desire born of God to keep his commandments. So when John writes here in 1 John chapter 2 of keeping his commandments, he's not speaking of sinless perfection. No believer is sinless or perfect. That's self-deception, as as John mentioned in verse number 8 of chapter 1. But it's because when we do stumble, we are to, uh, uh, verse 9, confess our sins. I'm so thankful as we looked at last week, we have an advocate We have someone that stands between us and our Heavenly Father who will forgive and will cleanse every stain of sin. A week ago, I told you about my shirt. Do you know how many people have told me how to get that stain out? I said, don't do it. Nobody listens to the pastor. Uh, uh, so we're going to try every one of those uh, 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 solutions, and we're going to see who was right. But you know what? Uh, while an ink stain may not come out of my shirt that I ruined several years ago, may I just tell you, when Jesus cleanses your, your sin, the stain of sin is gone. Our obedience to God proves our authentic faith in him. And faith always comes first, but faith is always validated by our obedience to him. The Bible says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So the surest mark of love for my heavenly father is obedience to him. Uh, Jesus said in John 15, in verse number, uh, uh, John 14, verse number 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments. In John 14, verse 21, he amplifies this thought when he says this, he that keepeth my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. Now, let me help you understand something. Some Christians are very emotional. They love to worship the Lord. They love to raise their hand. They love to sing praises to him. They often weep in his presence and are moved beyond words when uh, when they speak of his goodness. They strongly feel their love for God in an emotional level. May I say that's just fine. That's good. But other Christians are not so emotional. Perhaps you feel rather left out when others are weeping or someone raises their hand or someone acts out their feelings uh, publicly. That's okay, too. You know what I know? We are all wired differently. Just because you're not emotional does not mean that you do not love God. The greatest evidence is not that you are emotional or non-emotional. The greatest evidence that you have relationship with God is that you obey and keep his commandments. If the authentic believer keeps God's commandments, conversely, the counterfeit believer ignores God's commandments. The counterfeit believer ignores God's commandments. Some time ago, one of our church member computer gurus gave me a $50 bill. And that's a nice gift. I was excited about that. I was shocked that he would give me a $50 bill. There was a smirk on his face. Upon closer examination, I got the joke. It was fake. President Grant was gone, and he had imposed his pastor in his place. (laughs) I won't reveal the identity of the counterfeiter since he is here this morning. 
Counterfeit Christians are like counterfeit money. At a distance, they look like the real thing. But when you look closely, you see the striking differences. On my very first trip to Peru, way back in 2003, 2004, I was a novice at this international travel stuff. And I, 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 we landed at the airport. We exited the airport. And, um, and a, a, a guy speaking crisp English, he says, uh, uh, money exchange needed? And I had a $100 U.S. bill. Obviously, I needed to exchange money to be able to purchase things there in Peru. And, and uh, I had read in one of those travel guides that you never exchange money with someone on the street. But this guy looked honest. He looked, I mean, he talked perfect English like he really wanted to help me. And so I pulled out a $100 bill, and, uh, and he rolled it off, off the money. He handed it to me, and off we went. The next day, I, we had already left the airport in Arequipa. The next day, we're down in, the, in town, and we stopped to get something to eat. And uh, the, the person in Spanish tells me how, uh, how much it was. I pulled out my money, and I gave him uh, the dollar bills there. He looked uh, up here, and he goes, fake, fake, real. This guy had mixed in two fake bills with the real money. John says that the counterfeit Christian says, I know him. I know him. I'm real. But keepeth not his commandments. There are people like this in churches everywhere. There are people like this here in this auditorium this morning. They look like Christians. Perhaps they sound like Christians. At least outwardly, they perhaps even look like a Christian. Yet it is all for show because here's the thing. Inside, there's been no real change in them. Paul even wrote about this when he wrote Titus chapter 1. He said this, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. C.H. Spurden once said, An unchanged life is the sign of an unchanged heart. John says such a person... And he is direct, he is bold, he's offensive, for he says this, he's a liar, and the truth is not in him. Even non-Christians can spot a phony. The story was written in 1805. There was a number of Indian chiefs and warriors who met at Battle Creek, New York. Um, and they came to hear a presentation of the gospel by a missionary named Cram. After hearing about Jesus and his life-changing power, the story is written that there was an aged uh, uh, chief by the name of Red Jacket who stood and said these words, we have heard that you've been preaching about the, God, the great spirit to the whites who are our neighbors. We are well acquainted with them. We will wait a little while and see if the effect of the great spirit is upon them. If we find it does them good, makes them honest, and less inclined to cheat and belittle Indians, we certainly consider what you say. How convicting. I'm so thankful that the authentic believer demonstrates that he is being changed. We would be at different levels of that. A brand new Christian would not be changed to the level that someone who's been saved 25 years. The authentic believer not only keeps his commandments, but, but he, he keepeth or obeyeth his word. Uh, this refers to the general content of God's word. I could basically say it this way. The genuine Christian has a desire to know and do God's will. John says, in him verily is the love of God perfected. When I became a Christian at age 19, I was not only saved and sealed for eternity, I was changed on the inside. And God gave me a new nature. Theologians call this regeneration, which basically means recreation. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So in regenerating or recreating me, God did something spectacular. We read about this in Romans chapter 5. And hope 
maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad. That means it is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. God, in the person of the Holy Spirit, came to permanently live within. And here's what he does. He pours out his love in my life. Do you have that kind of relationship this morning? Boy, if you do, it's sweet, even if there's troubled waters. The love of God is not only poured out in my life, it's doing something in me. God, uh, John says here in verse number five that it is perfected, it is matured in me. In the life of an authentic believer, God's love uh, is, is a it, it, here's what it, it's accomplishing, it's, it's consummating, it's, it's consecrating, it's finishing me, it's doing a work in me. Paul says in Philippians chapter 1 that we can be confident in this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in me will perform it, will work on that until the day of Jesus Christ. John says, hereby we know that we know him. By what? By the fact that God's love is changing and completing us. Slowly but surely, if you have authentic relationship, you should become, be becoming more like Jesus. Are you Jesus with skin on? That's a convicting question this morning. More important than the million dollar question, who wants to be a millionaire, is do you have a relationship with God this morning? If that is true, then the mark number two of an authentic Christian is this, an authentic fellowship with God. A mark that John writes about that if you're an authentic believer, that you can have relationship, but you also can have authentic, real fellowship with God. Again, I never want to be confused between two words that I've used repeatedly over the last three weeks. One can have relationship without fellowship. So what in the world are you talking about Fellowship. Fellowship means this, an abiding in Jesus. John says, he that abideth in him. Abide comes from a Greek word meaning to stay, to dwell, to remain, to stand. Jesus used this same word when he told his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane to stay and to watch. To abide with Jesus is to stay with him, to have close, intimate fellowship with him. John uh, uh, Jesus used the same word in his teaching of the vine and the branches. He said in John 15, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Do you understand what was written here in John? That you can have relationship, that is, be a leaf on the vine. But you may not have fellowship in that you're not producing fruit. The evidence of your fellowship is that fruit is being that fruit is maturing, that fruit is ready for a harvest. Fruit is being produced. Fellowship means walking as Jesus walked, not only abiding him, but I'm going to walk as Jesus walked. John says that the person that saith he abideth in him, the person who claims to have fellowship with God, ought himself uh, to so walk, even as he walked. If you claim to have fellowship with Jesus, you should act like Jesus. And the proof of that, is, uh, of love, is your loyalty to Christ. A lot of believers look to pass when they think of fellowship with God. Oh, listen to this. I've heard this right here. Heard this in my previous ministry, and perhaps there's been times I've even said this. There are people who remember the joy of fellowship right after they were saved. They remember how they used to feel with God's power. They remember how they used to love to read God's word. They know that they began a relationship in the past. In fact, almost all of you can say the date, the time, the place, the hour that your relationship began. But there was once a time when your fellowship was brighter, more enthusiastic, more real than it is today. How many of you have ever gone to a high school reunion? You could participate. How many of you have ever gone to a high school reunion? When I think of some of my old high school friends, I remember them as they were when they were 18. 
In my teenage years, uh, uh, not that I approve of this man, but there was a song that Bruce Springsteen sang called Glory Days. It's about a guy who quick, he just can't quit thinking about all the fun that he had back in high school. The lyrics say this, time slips away and leaves with nothing but boring stories of glory days. I wonder how many of us, if we were to be honest, would have to confess that our glory days of fellowship with God are actually in the past. I've heard countless stories of couples who fell in love years ago, grew in that love. They stood before the altar. They began what seemed like a wonderful relationship. And over time, they they became neglectful and selfish in that relationship. And and today, they may still live together. They may even share a bed together. But they, they, they have relationship, but they have no fellowship. They have no shared joy. How many of us began a relationship with Jesus years ago? But today, this day, at this moment, there's no joy of fellowship in your relationship. John says if we want to abide in him, we have to walk even as he walked. How did Jesus walk? He was different. People were drawn to him. He spoke as one having great authority, the Bible says, and not as the scribes. Where did he get this magnetism from? How did he have so much power? How did he always have the perfect answer, the fitting word, the great consistency? Nicodemus, a well-educated man, came to him at nighttime so that no one else could see him, hoping to find out the secret of his power. Others came as well. The really strange part is that Jesus kept telling them the source of his power. They just wouldn't listen. May I just share some verses with you very quickly that Jesus told others about the fellowship he had, the source of the power, where the energy came from, where the love came from. He said this, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. My father worketh hitherto, and I work. The son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son likewise. I can of my own self do nothing, as I hear and I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the father which hath sent me. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. My doctrine is not mine, but him that sent me. I can do nothing of myself, but as my father hath uh, taught me, I speak these things. Do you get it? How did Jesus walk? He walked in a total, unbroken, unrelenting dependence and fellowship with his heavenly father. Now listen, we have access, direct access to that exact same fellowship today. It's amazing. Jesus Christ did not have greater access to his father than we have today. When my son Jonathan was small, he was super independent. And he would say this phrase, I can do it myself. And often we say that to God. And, and Jonathan, from the time he was a little boy, he's like, I can do this. I can do it. I will figure it out. I can do it. Um, I can ride that bicycle off the six-foot wall. I can do it. I saw it on television. I can jump from the couch to the fireplace. I saw it on television somewhere. I know that I can do it. Jonathan had this unrelenting, I can do it. I think about that, and often we say that to God. Learning to walk with God is not instant. Sometimes like physical therapy and spiritual therapy is painful. However, we can have it. And we must begin that fellowship with God in a total reliance on, I'm just simply here to do his will. Every winter, I'm finished. You can close your notes and I'm going to finish with an illustration here. Every, every winter, Uh, It snows in West Virginia. Usually uh, snow would be four to six inches before they would call off school. Can you even imagine such a thing here in Tucson? If they said it was going to snow tomorrow, everything's closed in Tucson. 
But it was usually growing up in West Virginia, everyone had the proper tires or chains. And, and, uh, and so it really, it would have to be a big snowfall for them to cancel church or, uh, or cancel uh, anything. But as a teenager, I remember one exceptionally bad snowstorm. It snowed all day. It snowed all night. And we got 24 inches of snow. That's a lot of snow. Of course, everything was canceled. It was going to be a fun day off from school. Even dad's work was called off, which was a crazy thing. And, 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 and school and, and nobody was on the roads because you could, the roads were impassable. So I went off to bed knowing that I could sleep in just a little bit longer. I didn't have to get up early. When I got up the next morning and I was headed to the chicken coop to feed and water the chickens that we had, uh, all of our winter clothing, boots and hats and gloves were kept in the basement of our house. And, um, and off to the basement I went to get ready. And once outside I noticed that there was a, a set of tracks already leading to the chicken coop and the cow barn. And thanks uh, to dad, he had already made a set of tracks and all I had to do was, was follow them. Since it was brand new snow, and I don't know if you've ever been around brand new snow, um, uh, uh, if you try to walk in 24 inches of snow by yourself, it takes a lot of work. But I quickly found out after just four or five steps that if I walked in my dad's footsteps, it was easy. So I took off to the chicken coop with the, um, the water bucket and the feed bucket and and I was placing one foot after another, my dad's foot, Prince, and, and uh, I began to help my dad with the chickens and the cows. Unbeknownst to me, back in the house, my mom was yelling at me. Uh, not a rare occurrence. Um, uh, she liked to do that. Um, uh, she was upset that my dad was doing all the work outside and I was being lazy and still in bed. And what happened is she looked out the back window and she saw that there was only one set of footprints to the chicken, to the chicken coop, as we called it. And she already knew my dad had been up early and that my dad was up there with uh, the pigs and the cows and the horse and the, and the chickens that we had on our farm. And, and really, my dad had been my savior. He had, he had prepared the way for me. So all I had to do was just walk in his footprints. I'd like to ask you a kind of a pointed question this morning. If someone were to observe the snow-covered fields of your life, uh, would there be one set of tracks, those of Christ? Or would there be two sets, one belonging to, to Christ and the other that is distinctly yours, and you're forging through life in your own pathway, your own desires? Are you a spiritual hypochondriac, or are you an authentic believer? Are you spiritually healthy? Or are you truly spiritually sick and anemic this morning? May I say I have all of your attention. Thank you so much for listening so wonderfully this morning. The Christian life is not a game. It's not a game of monopoly or clue or dominoes that you hope by chance that you could perhaps win. May I just tell you that an authentic relationship is possible. If you do not have that this morning, I beg of you to trust Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. The vast majority of the several hundred that are here this morning, I can say this, that I know that you have a relationship, but I ask you, do you have fellowship? Everyone look here for just one moment. Here's my question. Has there ever been a time that you had a closer fellowship to God than you do at this very moment? Has there ever been a time when the joy of your salvation in that relationship, it, it, it was so much brighter than it is at this moment that you are seated here? Has there ever been a time when you were actually closer and more proud of your salvation and more vibrant in your Christian life than you are at this very moment? I respectfully submit to you, if the answer to that question is yes, then you have a hindered fellowship this morning. Why wouldn't we want to be close to the Lord? Jesus said, it's not about my will, it's about his will. Father, thank you so much for the amazing attention that was given this morning by everyone that was here. 
I beg you, Heavenly Father, to allow your Holy Spirit to do a work in our hearts and lives at this moment. Father, may we seek authentic fellowship with you. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Two questions. Do you have an authentic relationship? That means you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. The second question is, do you have authentic fellowship? Do you have a dear, sweet fellowship with your Heavenly Father? Let's stand together with our heads bowed, eyes closed. Would you be willing to talk to the Lord this morning and make things right with Him and say, Lord, help me to have an authentic fellowship with you? If you're visiting with us and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you can begin that relationship today. If we could pray with you, we would love to do that. And as, Je- as Pastor Jason begins to sing, would you respond and just talk to the Lord? Let's have authentic fellowship with our Heavenly Father right now. All to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him in His presence day bowed or eyes closed just before Pastor Jason sings that next verse if you're a candidate for baptism would you be excused at this time and that way you can prepare to be baptized and uh, we would love to be a help to you at this time Um, let's sing let's sing that first verse all of us together prayerfully into the Lord this morning let's sing it back to him and if you can sing those words that I surrender all may that truly be your testimony this morning let's sing back to the Lord to Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live I surrender Before we're seated, the Spanish church is going to join us in just a moment for the baptism as we have multiple people uh, to be baptized, and so we're so thankful that they'll be coming in. But before you're seated, I want you to turn to someone. I want you to tell them one thing, and both of you do it, tell them one thing that you love about your Heavenly Father or something that He has done for you, a testimony about salvation, you're thankful for salvation. So take just a moment, and both, uh, both of you, you talk to someone else, and both of you give something you're thankful for as our Spanish church comes in, and, uh, and then you can be seated after you do that. Thank you so much. You can be seated.